it's good to get together and sip apple juice uh, every now and then. Um, I have just a few slides that um, give a little bit of history of the lab and, and uh, maybe a taste of some of the research that uh, is going on. But I thought since uh, it's a particularly auspicious day, and yes, I, I was hired on April Fool's Day. Um, How prophetic. Which, yeah, I figured it would, it would be useful as an excuse if things didn't work out. Um, if you um, come to the Magnet Lab and, and take a tour, or if you come for the open house, there's some informational signs along uh, one of the corridors. Uh, if you come on April Fool's Day, there's three of them that get swapped out. So I thought in, in honor of the day, I'd pick up the three uh, that somebody, um, I forget who, uh, uh, decided to change the wording around a little bit. So one is, can magnets affect things at long ranges? And the answer is absolutely. The Earth itself is a large magnet and can naturally be affected by other magnets. In recent years, the North Pole of the planet has been moving roughly our way. This is due not only to the magnet lab, but also <laughs> the numerous MRI machines in North America. And it goes on and on to talk about how we can snarl traffic. Yeah. All right. That's not true? No, none of this is true. Nothing you hear tonight is true. This one you've seen in Zing. Can high magnetic fields affect the weather? Uh, yes, but only at limited range. Um, storms have a lot of free electrical charges, observable as lightning, and tend to rotate because of the Coriolis force. This means we can affect them with our magnets. Current experiments are too crude for the fine control we desire, but if you ever notice that large storms tend to avoid Tallahassee as they move, that's us. You're welcome. Actually, within the first eight weeks of moving here, we had four hurricanes in uh, 2004, so I thought it was us. Um, is it safe for people to tour the lab when the magnets are running? Yes, for a limited amount of time. Our magnets differ from the magnets that are found in MRI machines. Unlike an MRI, our research magnets lack an oscillating protection coil that prevents the iron atoms from being pulled out of your blood and through the skin. A gauss is a measurement of how many iron atoms are being ripped from your body every second. We're not taping this, are we? The scientist here must take massive iron supplements to stay healthy. The painted lines on the floor are for safety. A person can stand, this is in boldface, can stand in the 10 gauss line for only an hour before requiring medical treatment. <laughs> the 100 gauss line requires exposure time less than five minutes. So, in that spirit, um, let me um, first say that it's been a real pleasure uh, being here in Tallahassee for 10 years and directing such a wonderful lab as, as the Magnet Lab. Um, and as you'll see in some of these slides, I've actually been involved uh, in the Magnet Lab since the very beginning, even though I've only been uh, employed here for the, uh, the 10 years. Um, I actually started my research career at the National Magnet Lab when it was up in Boston at, at MIT. So I just pulled together a few slides. Yeah, and, and I thought it was a mistake to move the lab down here at, at the time myself. Uh, pulled together a few slides. I. Uh, this projector tends to distort all circles, so it makes me look uh, even weirder than I usually do. But if you want the handsome version, uh, it's, it's projected over there. Um, the Magnet Lab actually has three campuses. And the Tallahassee campus is the largest uh, by far of the three. But I wanted to make sure that, that the folks here were aware that uh, part of the reason that we're as productive as we are scientifically is that we have three campuses. And the second campus is down at University of Florida, uh, and, we have, and we have a visitor uh, from there. Um, and they, uh, they specialize in ultra-low temperatures, and they also have uh, capabilities in magnetic resonance imaging and uh, other magnetic resonance uh, techniques that are used by chemists and biologists and um, uh, uh, folks doing biomedical research. And then out in Los Alamos in New Mexico, there's a DOE lab uh, where the atom bomb was uh, invented. Uh, they're very good with pulsed power, and we have pulsed magnets out there. And we have the, 
country's largest motor generator set. I don't know if you can see, but that's a guy standing next to this big motor generator set. This has two-thirds the capacity of Hoover Dam in terms of generating power, and we use it to pulse just one single magnet. So we have the biggest permanent, or the biggest electromagnet here in Tallahassee at the Magnet Lab, where we get a magnetic field that's a million times the Earth's magnetic field. But out in Los Alamos, where we turn the magnets on and off fast enough that they don't have a chance to melt, uh, we can get to twice that magnetic field, uh, to two million times the Earth's field, to 100 Tesla. And so actually our, our highest magnetic fields as a national laboratory are generated out in Los Alamos, but you only have that field for one thousandth of a second. So you can't do all the experiments you'd like to do. And so the Magnet Lab is strong because of this, this collaboration among the three sites that we have. We also continue to grow. Um, this, I, I can't help as a scientist, but show some data. So this is, uh, this is the number of users uh, who come to the Magnet Lab every year as a function of year since 2001. So we're still growing at a, a very nice pace. Uh, so even though uh, we've entered our 20s, um, uh, the grant to um, award the Magnet Lab to this consortium uh, was won in 1990. Uh, we opened our doors in 1994. Uh, but uh, even though we're entering our 20s as a laboratory, we're still growing at a nice pace. Do you have a question? Um, why is there such a precipitous drop when you took over? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, why, why this drop here? And the upper they must have seen me coming. Um, not sure. We call that an error bar in our business. <laughs> yes? I was going to ask why the technicians are dropping. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure. We started, we started keeping track of technicians, and I'm not actually sure what that category means. Um, but uh, the overall is that we get about uh, 1,400 visitors a year using our facility. Uh, students about 400, postdocs about 200. So there's a major educational component uh, to the Magnet Lab. This we call our Delta Airlines map. Um, in 2012, we hosted experiments by more than 1,350 users from 159 institutions across the United States that came to one of our three locations, uh, either here in Tallahassee or in Gainesville or in Los Alamos. Uh, that's a lot of um, putting our town on the map, uh, on the scientific landscape. And they come from a total of 277 institutions if you count throughout the world. So we have competing na uh, national magnet labs in Japan and in Europe. And we're very proud of the fact that when the scientists use those facilities and they've done everything they can do in those laboratories, uh, they come here to complete their experiments. Uh, so we're leading the world in uh, the magnet technologies and the techniques that we make available uh, to visiting users. Uh, this is just in one year alone, uh, 2012. So a couple pictures that they've pulled together. This is uh, the early, day, early days of the laboratory. The state of Florida uh, and Florida State University have been strong partners in the Magnet Lab from the very beginning. And their involvement in the Magnet Lab helped us uh, to win the competition uh, with MIT. Uh, my understanding was at the time that they poured this slab, which is about a meter thick of concrete, where our big magnets sit now uh, was the largest cement core uh, in the city uh, uh, to that time. Uh, so there's a major amount of construction that the state and the university were willing to put into uh, this endeavor uh, in order to make it successful from its outset. Um, I was uh, young and wasn't careful about everything that I wrote down early in my career, um, I was on the first users committee. So the users community elects their representatives and they come to a meeting every year and they review the lab, give us suggestions, give us feedback on how we're doing, things we could do better, opportunities maybe that we've missed, uh, congratulate us on things that we got right. This is the first visitors register that the Magnet Lab ever put out on the the front desk 
and uh, I was there as a member of the user uh, committee. Uh, this was in December of 1993, and at the time, there were not yet any active uh, magnets. The, there have been some magnets that have been purchased. Uh, the lab was poised to open its doors, and we were urging the lab to wait until they had built one of their own magnets that had set a record, and, and fortunately, within a year, the lab had done that and opened its doors with a splash. But in December of 93, if you're young and you're restless and you're bold and you forget that you're writing in ink, um, <laughs> so this is my signature. It's the first uh, entry into this uh, visitor's register. And over here in the uh, comments section, it says, nice lobby, where are the magnets? <laughs> and I lived in fear for many years that I could never become director of the lab because someone would find this register and hold it against me. But at the time, I looked a lot younger, so this is a completely different person uh, than the man who stands before you now. The dedication to the laboratory took place in October of 1994. Uh, we had Al Gore come down uh, to um, uh, uh, open the laboratory formally. Uh, this is Jack Crow, the first director of the lab, uh, the man who had the vision uh, that you could have a national magnet lab with a breadth of research that, that spanned from physics through engineering, through materials, chemistry, biochemistry, and biology. In many ways, it was his vision and his skills as a riverboat gambler uh, to land this ambitious uh, effort uh, for um, the state of Florida. Um, I joined the magnet lab first uh, by becoming director of the branch of the magnet lab out in Los Alamos. Uh, this is uh, the, the group out there. There's about 30 employees uh, total. Um, and uh, this in, in the background, it's kind of hard to see, but that's the big motor generator set that powers the big pulsed magnets out there. Um, it, if you live out west, you can get away with a much longer beard. Um, it kind of blends in in Los Alamos. It kind of looks unusual here uh, in the southeast if you're wearing a beard that's quite that long. Although with Duck Dynasty, um, it's, it's coming back in fashion. Um, I'm rather fond of tie-dye. We're very proud of the fact that we're the only national lab uh, for which you can buy uh, logo wear uh, that's tie-dye. Uh, all the other national labs, in my opinion, take themselves way too seriously. Um, <laughs> We, once a year, have an open house. If you've not been, I urge you to come. It's uh, the last Saturday in February. Uh, we have about 5,000 people coming through the lab. We have 100 hands-on exhibits. Uh, it's, it's great fun. Um, every year, I, I tie-dye my beard as well. And so, as you look at these photos, any photo that's taken over the last five years, you can tell what month it is by how long my beard is, because I grow it long. Uh, for the open house, and then I cut it short uh, shortly after the open house uh, is complete. But it's great fun to talk to the kids uh, that come through, uh, and they really are um, kids of all ages. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to see the excitement and, and curiosity that's uh, engendered in our visitors at the open house. Um, these are two major moments uh, that happened just uh, in the past year or so. This is um, Eric Barron, you may recognize. Um, and this is Fleming Krem from the National Science Foundation. Uh, National Science Foundation is our primary funding source. Uh, and this is the awarding of our five-year grant uh, that started in January of 2013 uh, for $168 million over five years. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we managed to avoid sequestration because of the quality of the research that's going on at our laboratory. Uh, and we're very pleased with the um, the ongoing and steady support that we get from the National Science Foundation. We exist because of this user program. The user program is strong because of the 350 scientists uh, that uh, are um, uh, working at the Magnet Lab. Actually, there's an old um, Henry Ford line. He was asked how many people work around here, and his answer was about half. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to say it's more like two-thirds at the Magnet Lab. Um, we, have, we have 350 uh, full-time employees, if you count professors and grad students and postdocs who are affiliated with the lab, uh, we're 500 folks here. Uh, so it's a large uh, scientific community 
a lot of high-tech jobs that are that are brought uh, into the local economy. Uh, those 1,300 visitors every year um, eat at restaurants and stay at hotels. Uh, so in conventional measures, uh, in addition to scientific measures, um, we're very proud of um, being a partner and being a part of the community. And then just recently, um, it looks like I put Neil deGrasse Tyson asleep here. Um, he uh, visited to give a talk uh, for the Student uh, Association at Florida State University. And it was great fun giving him a tour of the Magnet Lab and uh, getting him excited uh, about aspects of science that he wasn't aware of, uh, the many applications of, of high magnetic fields. So I have just two slides. Uh, I'll give you a few examples of, of research that's being done uh, at the Magnet Lab. You may or may not know that every motor, every generator, every air conditioner, automobile, cordless drill needs magnets. Anything that takes electricity and turns it into motion, uh, or motion and turns it into electricity, uh, involves co uh, coils that are carrying electricity uh, that are electromagnets, but then also permanent magnets. And we're doing research on more powerful permanent magnets. We're doing research on all kinds of strange materials that we call quantum matter. Uh, these are materials whose properties we don't yet understand. But what a lot of people don't realize is that materials research, it's sort of the least understood of, of research areas. Um, there's 20 materials in your cell phone that absolutely did not exist 20 years ago. Didn't exist. From the, the high impact plastics that are being used to the transistors that are being used uh, to, to make the phone work so rapidly to the antennas uh, that are being used to the glass that's on the front there's a vast array of materials research uh, that's being done at the Magnet Lab. Uh, this one happens to be uh, on uh, a purple dye that the Chinese knew about thousands of years ago, and they used to paint their, their terracotta army. Um, we study it because the electrons behave in a very, very strange way that might make for incredibly fast future uh, computers, quantum computers. We do a lot of work on superconductors, um, about 10% of all the power generated in the United States, or anywhere, is wasted just bringing the electrical power to your house. So when you see high voltage power lines, uh, the way I think about them is the world's largest toaster. You're just wasting energy in form of heat. And there's a lot of fundamental work being done on superconductors that can transmit electrical power without any friction, without any heat whatsoever. We're doing fundamental work on research on petroleum and how you might be able to refine lower grades of petroleum. The high grade petroleum will run out of uh, at some point in time, but there's loads of lower grade petroleum and high magnetic fields are able to do analysis uh, on how to best um, refine that material. This picture that's kind of hard to see is from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. We can actually you, uh, uh, measure a fingerprint of a tar ball sample and tell if it came from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill because every oil source has a different mixture of chemicals in it and high magnetic fields are the most accurate way to identify every single chemical uh, that's in a mixture of materials. Uh, there's research being done on uh, potential new pharmaceuticals like insect venom and antifungal chemicals that are in this shellless mollusk. Um, if you think about it, the saying, you can either fight or flee, is actually inaccurate. Uh, there's a third option that a lot of the natural world uses, and that third option is chemical warfare. So if you're small and you're slow moving, um, uh, if you're a mollusk and you don't even have a shell, uh, there are probably some chemicals that you've got access to that help keep you alive. And so high magnetic fields allow you to do research and identify what those chemicals are. There's some basic research on viruses and the surface of viruses and what is their shape so that antiviral drugs can be developed that uh, in, uh, uh, will not allow the virus to pass its RNA off into your cells. Uh, and uh, that research is being done in some of the highest magnetic fields available. We're making magnetic resonance imaging into high definition. 
we can now look at individual cells. Um, uh, most of the audience here, I think, is old enough to know about exploratory surgery. Um, when I'm talking to a younger crowd, oh wait, this is a very young crowd here. Um, when I visit schools, I try to explain that if you had a pain in your gut and it wouldn't go away, they would cut you open and they'd start poking around and looking for things that were wrong. And who would have thought that high magnetic fields would allow you to get a high resolution picture of the interior of your body? X-rays scatter off of heavy elements, like calcium, that's why you can see bones. But it's terrible off of water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. Well, magnetic resonance imaging actually tells you where the hydrogen is in your body. So it tells you where the water and where the fat is in your body, and that's why it's so good at imaging organs and soft tissues. And at the Magnet Lab, uh, we're pioneering high-definition magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, we're also tagging stem cells with gadolinium, for example, and so we can watch those stem cells uh, move to try to repair damaged areas of the living brain in a mouse that has suffered a stroke. So these are the stem cells that have moved to that damaged area of the brain. And then as a final example, uh, we're doing magnetic resonance imaging not just on hydrogen, where's hydrogen, but in this case we're looking for sodium. Uh, why would we look for sodium? Well, it turns out that cells before they die take up sodium and nobody knows why. But you don't have to know why in order to make use of this really cool trick. We've got high enough magnetic fields that we can make a magnetic resonance image of where the sodium is in a living mouse brain. So within a few days of chemotherapy, this tumor lights up, which means those tumor cells are sucking up sodium, which means they're going to die. So we're imaging the tumor, and we know the chemotherapy is working before the tumor is actually, the tumor cells are actually dead. And the present technology is you have to wait weeks or a month or more to do a traditional hydrogen image to see if the tumor is shrinking in size. So the implications of the high magnetic field research here uh, I think are, are obvious. And I want to just give you a flavor of the kind of research that's taking place from new materials to quantum computers to superconductors to natural uh, pharmaceuticals that are out there waiting to be discovered to magnetic resonance imaging that's being done at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory that's sitting right here in, in your backyard. And it's been a pleasure uh, to be director of the lab. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much.